Good afternoon, everyone. Sorry, it took me just a minute to get things rolling for myself today. And you are here with Senator Liz Krueger. Welcome to everyone. And today's discussion, which is the first day of a three day virtual senior resource fair. So if you don't know about it, you are more than welcome to sign in again tomorrow and the day after that as well. But this afternoon, I want to welcome our program participants and let them know that our discussion on either Zoom or Facebook, or perhaps you're calling in by phone, is on reaching out beyond loneliness, how to begin to build networks and find community. And while we call this a senior resource fair, frankly, the issue of loneliness is an issue for any age group. And so if you've signed on because you heard this might be relevant, please don't go anywhere if you don't define yourself as an older New Yorker, because these are important issues for all of us. As always, we have closed captioning for today's event. And as a viewer, you have to activate your closed captioning to view the text on your device. If you're in Zoom, check live transcript in the meeting controls to start viewing closed captioning. And if you're on Facebook Live, you'll see a settings button on the bottom right hand corner of the video. Check, click on CC for closed captioning to activate the process. We have found that people with any kind of hearing impairment can have a really greater access to anything we present if they put their closed captioning on. So even if you're not sure this is for you, you might want to try it because you might be very pleased. This forum is being recorded and everyone who RSVP'd will receive an email with a link to the event video and the resources that are going to be posted in the chat during the course of the presentations. So they'll all be sent to you along with presenters PowerPoints. So don't think you need a pad and pencil and need to write everything down that you're hearing or getting cited because you'll have access to it all within a day or two. A couple of quick reminders. Early voting begins this Saturday, October 26th and runs through Sunday, November 6th. Election day is Tuesday, November 8th. To find out your early and election day poll site locations, you can call the NYC Board of Elections, which is 866-VOTE-NYC, or you can go to their website, which will be posted in the chat. Just a note, the location you go to for early voting might not be the same location if you change your mind and decide to go on election day. So if you look up early voting and then you don't get there in time, double check what your poll site will be on actual election day. I've had that happen to me and been, wait a second here. I know this was a polling site for the last eight days. So check first. Regarding vaccines, if you are trying to locate where to get your COVID booster or your flu shot, you can click on the New York City Department of Health's vaccine finder and this link is also posted in the chat. And again, just this morning, more data coming out of the health experts in the world. This new booster for Omicron is making a huge difference in the level of COVID you might find yourself sick with. So yes, you could still get COVID, but if you've taken the vaccines and this new Omicron booster, the likelihood of your ending up very sick or God forbid having to go to the hospital is reduced dramatically. So don't think, why do we keep telling you about new shots you have to take? We're just trying to keep you healthy. All right, as an overview of today's event, I wanna to talk to you about loneliness, that it's a really important issue affecting our physical and our mental health. And it doesn't only impact older people. Research has found that across age groups, feelings of loneliness is surging in the United States. And it was surging prior to COVID with 61% of Americans describing themselves as sometimes feeling lonely. COVID only made many of us feel lonelier. And like the illness itself, 
loneliness and isolation hit older adults community particularly hard. Many of us did not go out or see our other family members or friends for months at a time. And still many older adults fearful of being infected remain isolated. That is why I thought it was particularly important to devote one of our senior resource sessions to this topic, not only to outline the seriousness of the problem, but more importantly, to share concrete, accessible resources to ease the distress of loneliness. To do that, we have a wonderful panel of speakers. First, we'll hear from Greg Olson, the acting director of the State Office for the Aging, who will speaking about the, speak about the health impacts of loneliness and resources that the state has been finding and developing to help us. Next, we will hear from the Reverend Matt Hayde, the rector of the Church of the Heavenly Rest, who will talk about creating community and expanding your networks. The following speaker will be Alden Prouty, who will share the wonderful program that Carnegie Hill Village developed to support engagement with others. And after Alden, the team from Health Advocates for Older People, led by Nancy Houghton, the Executive Director, and Elizabeth Timberman, will talk about programs and services available to older adults right here in our community. We will also hear from Josh Krasner Health, Heath Health, who coordinates the Fall Prevention and Home Safety Program. Our final speaker will be James Goldman, a supervising social work worker at Lenox Hill Neighborhood House, who will speak about their friendly visiting program. So we're going to start with our acting director of seniors programs and services for the state of New York, Greg Olson. Good afternoon, Greg. Senator Kruger, great to see you and thanks so much for the invite. And you're absolutely right for all the folks that are listening today. I thought your context was outstanding. Uh, this is not an issue that's unique to older adults. Uh, this is across the age spectrum. And um, you know, kudos to you again uh, for providing an opportunity uh, on a really important issue. I wanna thank your staff and uh, folks from the Senate, Wendy, Justin, Brad, and Ian for um, all the work that they've done and all the TA behind the scenes uh, to make this run, run great and the, this amazing panel that we're on. Um, as I mentioned, um, we are social beings. We do not do well when we're lonely and isolated. And, and the Senator's exactly right. I mean, this is something that our network has been um, trying to address really since 1965 in the Older Americans Act, where it actually uh, you know, requires us to, to do things to get people out and keep them socially um, you know, engaged and connected. Uh, and the pandemic obviously made that worse. But again, this is not uh, exclusive to older adults it's across the age spectrum. And there's been a lot of things that we've all collectively done from county offices for the aging to many of their uh, their contractors and all the CBOs that are on this panel today, both within the city and across the state to provide transportation to get people out uh, the, the development of the entire senior center network. Uh, to bring people in and, and meet each other and eat together, uh, fairs, trips, and social events, friendly visiting, and you'll hear uh, James Goldman's program today, which is a fantastic one, phone trees, and so much more. So my job today was to kind of build upon what the Senator started with in terms of what the data shows, uh, because it, it should be an eye-opener for all of us, but it's not something we should be surprised about, but I think when you when you have real research to back up why this is such an important issue and why it's an all hands on deck approach, regardless of what you do, whether you serve young people or older people, uh, to keep people connected, um, you know, it's something I think we're all going to continue to deal with because it's really a public health epidemic. So let's just look at some of the data. Um, during uh, in 2018, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, CMS and AARP released a report, and this has been cited over and over again, so you might have seen of some of this, um, but they aggregated the data on what isolation and loneliness meant to the Medicare population. And what they found that it was equivalent to smoking almost a pack of cigarettes a day, cost $6.7 billion a year to treat. And the treatments were very similar to individuals who had 
arthritis, high blood pressure, heart disease, diabetes, and obesity. I mean, just think, uh, let that sink in for a second. Um, that's what they were able to find. The Nas Nat uh, National Institute of Health also found that social isolation and loneliness uh, had a huge impact on cognitive decline, depression, heart disease, high blood pressure, obesity, a weakened immune system, Alzheimer's disease, uh, increases your mortality rates and, and others. I mean, it, this isn't fluffy stuff. Uh, loneliness and isolation will kill you. And if you're marginalized or have chronic conditions can make them much, much worse. Social isolation, again, uh, increases a person's risk of premature death. Um, I talked about the smoking and obesity. It was associated with about a 50% increased risk of dementia. And I know that's something we're all concerned about. Uh, poor social relationships uh, were associated with a 29% increased risk of heart disease and 32% increased risk of stroke. It was associated with higher rates of depression, anxiety, and suicide. And I, I think you could all see why that would be. And among heart failure patients specifically, nearly four times more increased risk of death, 68% increase in hospitalization, and a 57% increase uh, risk of emergency department visits. So what Senator Kruger said is exactly right. The impact on our overall health um, and our mental health is well, well defined. So we're gonna be talking today about lots of ways to address this. And you know what? Sometimes the simplest solutions are the ones that don't cost any money. Um, I'm not gonna age myself, but the many of you who are um, you know, tuning in today will remember a time when you were growing up um, or raising a family where you knew who your neighbor was, um, you know, whether it be in your building, on your floor or next door. And we seem to have gone away from that a little bit. So some of the simple things are just to reach out to somebody who may be living on your floor or is in your building or you see walk by every day. Uh, volunteering is a fantastic way um, to not only give back um, and, and, and provide uh, really good outcomes for your own time, but obviously to interact. And for somebody uh, like me and many of the panelists here today will tell you, we would not have the robust uh, aging services infrastructure without our volunteers. So that's a great way. Uh, learning something new and taking a risk. Um, you know, if, if there's a hobby that you're interested in, many of the organizations that will be on today or others that are available in the city or elsewhere, uh, there's a lot of opportunities to do that and we'll welcome you in. Um, if you're not good at, you know, making friends or, or um, you know, breaking the ice, you can ask a friend of yours to introduce you to somebody else. And there's lots of opportunities at libraries and senior centers and other congregate sites and, and programs um, where you can have that entree. I don't wanna take James's thunder, but in partnership with the health department, our Association on Aging in New York and DeRote, we created a series of uh, videos um, on how to actually establish going from idea to implementation of friendly visitor program. So that link is right here on my slide deck, but I also believe it'll be in the chat. Uh, and we've implemented a couple of other things utilizing technology. Now, technology is never designed to replace a human being, but we, we just can't snap our fingers and make another human being appear uh, to be friends with somebody else. And so our animatronic pet project um, has been proven not only to reduce isolation, loneliness, and pain, but it's now been replicated actually in 35 states across the country. And we've distributed about 10,000 pets in New York City. Uh, LEQ is another platform that's very proactive, that engages uh, the individual. I won't get into that because I know I only have five minutes. For anybody over the age of 50, we are fully subsidizing over 900 lifelong learning and other types of classes to help people get engaged and, and continue to do things that they like to do, whether it's health and wellness or photography or cooking or what have you. If you click this link, um, you can you can access any of those classes for free. And if you're over the age of 50 and you have a special skill set, you're a knitter, you like to cook, you're into photography, you, you play an instrument, you can actually sign on and teach a class and get paid for it. And that's a little extra money in your pocket during the pandemic. And then finally, we launched a partnership with Pets Together, which uses the value of live therapeutic pets uh, to help uh, reduce isolation and connect people um, by using the, the the pet as an icebreaker. So 
that's a real quick snapshot of just some of the things that that we are doing. But I think that we all have a role in this, um, whether it be, you know, some of these more innovative things uh, that utilize technology or just some of the basics that we all grew up with. Um, it's not it's not always that hard as somebody's passing you to say, hi, my name is Greg. Who are you? I see you live in in uh, 4B um, and start a conversation that way. So, Senator, as always, you're right on the mark. And I can't thank you and your staff uh, enough for not only inviting me, but for addressing really um, the cutting edge issues that that we all ought to be focusing on. Well, thank you for so much for being with us today, Greg. And I know that as the commissioner, you are very focused on this issue, which is so important to people throughout the state of New York. Our next speaker, as I think we already heard of, is the Reverend Matt Hayde, who is the rector at the Church of the Heavenly Rest. Hello, rector, Reverend, excuse me. <laughs> uh, Matt, hi, Senator. Uh, thank you for for sponsoring this today and, and for your leadership in this really important area. I wanna carry forward what uh, the commissioner talked about in terms of building community. Community is central to combating loneliness and that's something uh, we think we know a little bit about. Community is the way in which we live together, we work together and we find joy and, and some respite from all the things that beset our lives. We, Heavenly Rest, is a church. We're a Christian community, but this is true across all faith backgrounds and, and areas of life. Um, so I want to talk today about how to carry forward some of what the commissioner talked about in terms of building community in your life. Now, we actually uh, have adopted this in our own community, from a partner, uh, Central Synagogue. Uh, this is something that Central Synagogue has used with their own community and we've used with ours. Um, and it's simple, a way to keep track of the kind of efforts that, uh, that the commissioner just talked about. Um, and it's three simple numbers, five, three, one. Five, how many people do you know more about than just their name? Who are the people whom you know, work with, um, are in your community that you know more than just their name? You know their stories and they know your story. It's so important for our lives to be able to talk to people on a daily basis. And so what we've done with our community is to begin to keep track of the number of people we see out in the community. It could be someone in your building. It could be someone you see when you go to a senior center or a church or synagogue or a mosque or other place of worship. It could be someone at the store whom you see every day in our neighborhoods in New York. To be able to have a network of people who know you, who see you, who miss you when you're not there is very important. And so I encourage you today, this afternoon, when you go out to uh, be able to make this list. And maybe you can make it just offhand, but maybe this becomes a task in the days ahead is to be able to see the people who um, might be people you talk to every day, who you can share things going on in your life, who can share things going on in their life with you and who um, you keep up with and keep up with you. This is the beginnings of community, being to know people in New York. Now, I think it's easy in the city to go whole days and not really talk to anybody because we can all be anonymous. But all of us, whoever we are, wherever we live, um, whatever the everyday circumstances of our lives, can begin to form this network together. You might already have it. You might have your five right now. But if you don't, make it something you do in the days ahead to begin to see who the people are who you can talk with and begin to know who will miss you who can listen to you and to whom you can listen and know they're there. Now, the second part of this gets a bit more serious. Who are the three people whom you know can call you, you know they can count on you when they're in trouble, when they're in the emergency room or uh, having medical issues or some other issue uh, in their lives or just having the worst day they've ever had? Who are the three people can call you who know they can count on you? This is important. Now, all of us do this 
in the way that we can. All of us have different gifts and skills and resources. So not everyone can go to the emergency room with someone and not everyone should. But to be someone that others can count on is an important part of building community together. This is what we do for each other, to be able to respond to each other when we're in trouble. Now, all of us have, we believe, incredible gifts to offer wherever we are, whatever our circumstances of our lives. As to be someone people can count on means that you recognize your gifts, you offer them back to others. Maybe it simply is you're able to connect them to resources they didn't have before, help them make uh, contact they wouldn't have been able to make otherwise, or simply to listen on the phone or even nowadays on Zoom to people having a really bad day. Part of building community is to be someone people can count on when they're having trouble. So this is beyond the five folks who uh, you know and know your story. Who knows you? Who can count on you when they're having a really bad day or need a resource of some kind that your gifts, your unique gifts can provide. And the third, more serious still, who's the person you can call if you are in trouble? If you're having a medical emergency, if you're having uh, trouble somewhere in your apartment, somewhere in your life, or simply having a day that's the worst day you can remember or imagine. Who's the person you can call on first? Now, in New York, sometimes that's our family of origin. And sometimes it's the people who we've come to depend on in our lives here in the city. People we meet in the city, people we've worked with over time, people we see. Um, at our community center, at our place of worship, somewhere in the neighborhood. There's someone you know beyond just name or story, uh, someone you can count on when you're in trouble. To know who that person is, is a very important thing for our health and safety, a very important thing back for our community. Now, we know that there are healthcare proxies and official things like that. Those are important. Know those people. This may be that person, or it may be simply someone you can call on a day we need to talk. We need to talk about something beyond how the weather is or, or how you're doing. Something, talk about the most serious things in life. To know this person before you need them is really important. So the commissioner gave all the data that we both intellectually understand, but feel in our hearts we know to be true, that Loneliness is an epidemic, and the way out of that is to build community. And our friends at Central Synagogue have helped us understand in our community how we might do that. And it's three simple numbers. Five, three, one. Five people whom you know, who uh, you give more than just, just your name, they know your story, and you know theirs. Three people can count on you when they're in trouble. And one person can count on we need the most. Blessings. We're always here to be community and to help build community in New York. And Senator, again, we're grateful for your leadership in this important effort. Thank you so much, Reverend. You know, and that's it's so elegant and simple as you described it. And yet just hearing you describe it, it's so obvious why that would be so valuable, both from a give and a take situation for everyone. So thank you so much for sharing that with us. Next up is our representative from Carnegie Hill Village, Alden Pruti or Pruti. One, I'm doing it wrong one way or the other, she'll correct me. And I think it's really fascinating about the development of Carnegie Hill Village and what it's doing in our in one of our communities. So welcome, Alden. Thank you, Liz. It's Prouty. Um, I'm very happy to be here. And I don't have a written presentation because what we do at Carnegie Hill Village is a lot of talking. So I'm going to start with how we started. And I got a call uh, about six years ago from Jilda Ray, who is an old friend. And she asked me two questions. She said, have you ever heard of Beacon Hill Village? And have you read the book by Atul Gawanda called Being Mortal? Well, I remember opening the New York Times in the early 2000s and seeing the article on Beacon Hill Village, which is about an aging in place movement in Boston. 
And I thought, this is the best idea. And that, of course, I'd read Atul Gawanda and the importance of friendship and making sure you're not lonely. So based on that, Carnegie Hill Village was started by about 11 people aboard and we worked together to figure out what we were gonna do. And the first thing we did was get the census numbers for the, the historic Carnegie Hill, which is 98 to 86. And at that point it was from 5th to 2nd Avenue. And um, with the help of Carnegie Hill, neighbors and their newsletter, we put a survey in to find out what people wanted. Because these villages are all different depending on where people live. You know, some of them are based on helping drive people. Well, we're not doing that, but we can do a lot of other things. So um, we found out that people were looking for social connections. They didn't need somebody to walk them to the doctor. Although if that happens later on, of course we help with that. But it was just simply ways of people getting together and, and meeting each other and doing interesting things together. So that's how we started. Um, and then um, we um, were part of, a, of the movement of over 200 uh, villages in the United States. We have no building. We have no employees. We have a very hardworking board of 12. And we run the communications by, by email. But um, we run the, uh, the membership meetings and, and groups and talks by getting together. Except during COVID, we had to resort to Zoom, which worked pretty well, but, but most of the things now are going live. So we have a lot of different things. And I'll just give you a sense of the, of the groups that we have. We have a meditation group. We have uh, a needlepoint group, which just started. We have a short story group, which I run. We have 24 people in it. We read a couple of short stories each month and we, we talk about them. And we've been meeting now for five years and we really know each other. And it's, it's a lot of fun. Uh, then we have a TED Talks group. We have a men's discussion group. We have exercise groups. We have one-on-one -on -one walks on Mondays and Wednesdays in Central Park. And then we have diner rounds at uh, a couple of different restaurants. One of the favorites is Lexington Avenue Pizza up at 101st and Lex and Lex restaurant and bread and wine on Lexington and uh, Il Carino on second and um, always looking for new venues. We maybe 12, 14 people get together and sign up. It's very popular. Um, we have art and architecture tours and um, they're very popular. And uh, whether it's museum, uh, I mean the um, New York Historical Society or uh, the Met or the Whitney, uh, uh, we have a lot of people who are docents and can uh, give us introductions to museums and to lead tours there. So that's, a, that's really a, a great thing. Then we have uh, lectures and um, Many of them have been about problems in aging or challenges, I guess. We never use the word problems anymore, but challenges. And, um, and so uh, Mount Sinai has been a great resource for everybody. And we've had many of the doctors and speakers and, and, uh, and, and some of them will repeat again, whether it's on mobility or dizziness or hearing loss or, or depression um, or just normal things to expect as we go through the years. Um, we also have music. We have uh, singing, several singing groups that perform and, and in December we will have a concert. Um, and then, um, uh, then we have members of get togethers and we have uh, parties. We just had a party over uh, Church of Holy Trinity and there were 60 people who came and it was a lot of fun. People got to talk to each other. And, um, and then we have um, a, a weekly uh, photo and poem. Most of the photos are by Maria Cox, who's a wonderful photographer. And then other people also submit photos. And then I find some poetry or quote to go with them. And that's been a lot of fun. And we started that during COVID because we figured we need something to charge up the week. 
And then um, last year we started um, an interview, which is st starting slowly, but called Interesting Lives, because there's so many people in Carnegie Hill Village that have led very interesting lives. And it, 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 many of them professionally, but they've had interesting sidelines. And so we do an interview with those people. And that's that's been very successful. Um, and we just have a collection and that's on the website. Um, the membership started probably, uh, well, we, we're now in our having our fifth anniversary. So we're getting going and uh, established. And there are uh, uh, about 166 members. We expanded our boundaries uh, uh, less than a year ago uh, to go uh, from Second Avenue all the way to East End, over to the river, and then down south to 79th so that um, we have a much bigger area and there were lots of people over there who wanted to join. So we're, we're growing, we welcome new members and you'll have a way of getting to know people uh, because it's personal. It's it just these small groups of people getting together, the walking, all these things are ways of really knowing each other. And I was just walking down Fifth Avenue the other day and I ran into four people, people I had not known three or four years ago. And it's such a nice thing to walk down the street and run into your neighbors and your new friends. And there are people who say it just transformed our lives. Uh, they they'd known people, but they had not have the number of friendships they have now. So we encourage uh, you to join us if you fall within our area 98th to 79th and over to the river from Fifth Avenue. It would be great to have you. Thank you, Alden. Thank you so much. And I think what's so important to know is in listening to Alden describe how the village has evolved and grown, that any neighborhood of people can take a stab at starting their own village. Um, and there are a number of good resources out there about how other communities have also picked up on this. So thank you so much. Uh, our next Presenters are a panel from Health Advocates for Older People, Nancy Houghton, Josh Krasner, and Betsy Timmerman, and they will choose in what order they are going. Hello, everybody. Hi, Josh, I see you coming on. Are Nancy and Betsy here, or are you going first? Um, no, it's Nancy and then Betsy. And, and then. Okay, so... Nancy, can you go off of mute and turn your camera on? There you are. Hi, uh, okay, now I see Nancy and Betsy. We've got the three. Good afternoon. All right, thank you for having us. So actually, hello everyone. I want to thank Senator Kruger and all of her staff for sponsoring this wonderful program for seniors today. The mission of Health Advocates is to provide safe and healthy aging through programs designed to facilitate independent living, physical well-being, and greater social action interaction between women and men. Health Advocates was founded in 1985 by a group of community social workers to help improve life for underserved older adults in the Bronx. They worked in the Bronx to increase available health care for seniors in clinics there. Today, Health Advocates has 1,500 members and participants of our Healthy Aging Program, participating in 24 Zoom and in-person classes every week. Loneliness among seniors is a great concern in our community today, as Greg Olson spoke about earlier. It's highest in people over 80, Due to people living alone, the death of a spouse, or death or loss of friends, hearing loss, mobility challenges, 
vision problems and lack of engagement with others contribute to this problem of aging alone. We've been asking ourselves at Health Advocates, what activities or classes can we provide to combat loneliness? A primary focus of Health Advocates is on fostering friendships, social engagement with others, and strategies to prevent loneliness. We, we are concerned and believe that loneliness can be alleviated by authoring seniors opportunities to participate in exercise and fun activities with others who then they get to know over a period of time. Individuals who share interests often develop bonds that foster friendships and the nurturing comfort of belonging to a group. What Health Advocates specifically does is to offer free programs and activities seven days a week that promote balance, flexibility, and strength to age with vitality and independence. These classes include six chair yoga classes, three strength classes, one Alexander technique, three Tai Chi classes, one Reiki, one nutrition class, two harmonica classes, and one weekly movie and a bridge and rummy cube class. We also have a dance class once a week. Our trained instructors are smart, kind, and caring. Health Advocates also has three seasonal lunches during the year. One that includes a fashion show by the participants themselves. The lunches bring more than 100 seniors together to share a meal and enjoy being with others. These lunches include 20 to 25 volunteers bringing generations together to chat and to make seniors feel welcome. Health Advocates has more than 50 community partners that help us reach more seniors together than we could on our own. Regis High School is a good example of this. Currently, 10 of their high school seniors. Nancy, you've just gone on mute again. Can you unmute? Okay, um, 20 of our, currently 10 of Regis students do community service with us on Tuesday from 9 to 11.30, tutoring seniors on how to use their smartphones, iPads, uh, and any other kind of tech equipment they, they need help on, as well as they enjoy a game of chess with seniors who sign up. The, the volunteers grocery shop for the seniors. They accompany them on walks with their dogs. They escort seniors to programs and appointments. They deliver wheelchairs and walkers to seniors who need them. This intergenerational program is an example of how we can reach more seniors together. It's a bonus to all of the people involved, young and old. Participants tell us there's always something interesting and fun that they can be part of at Health Advocates. They feel welcome at our programs and they depend on Health Advocates to be a place where they can connect with others every day. I'm hoping that those of you who are listening today who are not members of our Healthy Aging Program will consider joining us. We would love to have you. 
And now I want to thank Senator Kruger for having us today. It's been a great opportunity for us. And I want to now introduce Betsy Timberman, who is the chair of our advisory board. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. Um, and thank you, Liz, Wendy, Justin, Ian, and everybody who's spoken here today. It seems like uh, we're all coming to this together from different sources of the need of the opportunity for people, not just younger, but older as well, uh, because depression has been rampant throughout our nation. We've lived with COVID and there've been so many things that um, have affected everybody. And of course, you know, if you're an older person, your family may not be right there. Uh, you may not be tech savvy. Um, although I have to say, a lot of older people have started using Zoom. It keeps them in touch with their families who don't live nearby. I love um, uh, Matthew Hyde's program of one of five three one. I think it's an absolutely wonderful thing that we can incorporate in the things we do. But I'm the chairman of the advisory board of health advocates. Um, they consist of, we consist of a group of community leaders who are interested in the well being of others. And as Nancy mentioned, we do so much, um, you know, having partners in the things that we do. Um, the general board meets three times a year to discuss what each one of our members, our community partners, are doing and what we can do to improve opportunities, not only for seniors, but to people who maybe their family members, people around them, people want to be assured that people are taken care of, you know, such as the neighbor program that um, has been discussed. Um, and through those discussions, Health Advocate has actually produced a couple of things that are innovative. We have, um, we have developed a nutrition handbook that not only tells you what you're eating, but what the eating does to you or for you. So you know, um, it's not a diet book at all. It just is information that people can use as they wish. It has simple recipes if you like to cook. We have a senior housing resource book that was started by one of our advisory board members. And we actually located every senior housing facility in Manhattan and part of the Bronx were you know, moving off to Brooklyn as well. And the book is arranged by zip code. So if you know the zip code, you can look at the book and you know, see what the possibilities are. And it actually was on the website, uh, formerly on the website of the New York Department of Aging. Um, we also have an equipment handbook. Uh, this was put together by one of our people who was a physical therapist of what kinds of things you might need temporarily or you know, you know, whether it be something simple like the kind of light that you put in a socket so that you can see when you leave a bedroom at night, it could be anything. And um, you may need it temporarily or you may want it forever. But these, are, it shows you where you can find these things and, you know, what they look like. But today um, we're here to address loneliness um, and isolation with not only with our fellow members or our participants of health advocates. Um, we, member sounds, it, it's not clubby, it just sounds like we're all part of something. And um, the goal is to prevent and alleviate um, isolation by providing as many opportunities as we can for people over 60 and younger too for those people who want to help and participate, such as Nancy's discussion about the Regis program. Um, they, it, what it does is that it, well, it gives people a sense of companionship. And um, we bring our partners, our volunteers, uh, and our people together, our participants together, um, you know, over through interests and learning and friendship. And as Nancy mentioned, we do this not only through exercise and strength training, but we those dozens of classes are free every single week. All you need to do is call health advocates to say you'll be attending. Um, we have strength and exercise training programs and we're doing something with one of your participants who's gonna be on tomorrow, having to do with posture because it's not just standing straight. It has to do with how we walk, how we navigate, how we breathe, 
And I mean, it's good for everybody. We just happen to be doing it with her and you're showing her tomorrow, Lynn Commando. Um, we have music and dancing, as Nancy said. We do harmonica training, not training. I mean, we have a harmonica program. People may take it because they like music, but it does two things. First of all, music in the brain is a great stimulant for you know intellectual ability that's been proven the other thing is that people have breathing difficulties they're doing something that's fun so not it's not like breathing through a tube to see if you can make that little ball go up um, it's it's quite interesting and people get lost in it um, we have skilled games such as bridge chess room cube and we also teach new skills through our regis volunteers whether it's learning how to oh i just can't make my phone do this or I don't want to do that but how could I do this and they're patient and they're lovely and it's not their parents so they're very very gentle and and um and um you know sort of neutral about it they they think it's fun too because they love to learn um we have writing workshops and those workshops I think are absolutely wonderful because they do a couple of things they let people explore the way they think they also let people investigate their own creativity um, and people come together to discuss what they've written or what they'd like to read. We've had trips and tours to do museums and to do fun things. Uh, Nancy mentioned, well, maybe you didn't, but you know, walks in Central Park, I guess it was Alden that mentioned that too. And they're wonderful TED Talks. And the thing that I think is really wonderful is opportunities to volunteer. Whether you're young or old, people there are people that have interests in things. And here is an opportunity to work with Volunteer Referral Service or the Churches of the Heavenly Rest or Abyssinian Baptist Church. These are all of our partners. We also partner with New York Presbyterian Cornell, Wild Cornell. I always get it. I always call it New York Hospital, but it's now got so many initials, I get lost in it. But they uh, work with us on programs on cardiology and mental health and, um, you know, loneliness prevention. And Nancy mentioned that we have a harvest lunch in the flood that's coming up in November. It's all home cooked. It's all home served. The um, members sit down with their friends, but they also participate. And there's a fashion show that's being uh, run by one of our volunteers. And the people who are participants may show something that they wore when they got married or their first trip to Europe or, you know, something that was handed down by their parents. And it's really wonderful. You get to know people and you get to see their interests. And we also have a Mardi Gras luncheon, again, all staffed and cooked, home cooked by volunteers. And um, it, it's just wonderful. We have dancing there as well. So um, if amazing how many people like to dance. You think they can't get out of a chair, but they can, and they love to move. So we'd like to move them too, <laughs> make them feel happy. The focus of all of our efforts is to prevent isolation, to delight our participants, to get them over their fear of reaching out, um, to have them turn on, I call them the happiness muscles, by trying something and repeating it. And um, telling a friend tells a friend tells a friend. It's sort of what Matt Hyde said about the, you know, who, you know, somebody to partner with, or maybe, or just say, I went to this wonderful book club. You should come with me the next time. Um, anyway, we think that health advocates uh, with a friend telling a friend telling a friend is a place, a happy place to be. And we love what we're doing. It helps all of us, older and younger. And um, anybody who wants to call the office um, to participate, uh, I think Nancy will provide the telephone number in the chat room. We'd love to have you. And thank you again, everybody here for letting us um, participate and introducing our constituents to all of your marvelous programs as well. That sounded garbled, but I meant well. Thank you. Thank you. And Josh, finally, we're going to get to you also. Hi. Hi, thank you, Senator Kruger, for inviting me and the rest of our organization today and for everyone who helped organize it. Uh, my name is Joshua Krasner. I'm the Home Safety Fall Prevention Coordinator at Health Advocates. 
I oversee the Living Better by Design program that assists seniors and aging not only safely, but gracefully within the confines of their own home. Most homes are designed for able-bodied people and are not age-friendly at first. There are always plenty of solutions to maintain a high quality of life in a functional living space, no matter how old you are. If I am fortunate enough to conduct a, vis a visit to a participant's home, I go about it with a gentle approach, developing a rapport and simply having a conversation about their needs and concerns. If their participant is comfortable enough, I then thoroughly examine each room of their home, paying attention to its accessibility, proper lighting, and any other impediment that could be a fall risk. Observing the participant's mobility is also key in making the best proper assessment possible. After my visit, I take a look at the home assessment and subsequently notify the participant the best possible products and modifications that need to be done, from grab bars to non-slip mats, bed rails, lamps, armchairs, removal of door sills, et cetera. We also have a product catalog on our website where we reference pricing and the stores where the equipment may be purchased. The service of a home visitation and assessment is of course open to all health advocate participants, but we've also expanded our base by partnering with Visiting Nurse Services and University Settlement, where I have had the pleasure to visit homes in Chinatown and the Lower East Side, assisted by a Cantonese translator. Providing these resources to participants who normally wouldn't be able to access it on their own has been one of the most rewarding parts of my job. Besides going on home visits, I have had the honor of carrying the message of aging in place to various organizations, whether to be presenting to other nonprofits, religious institutions, or corporations, and letting people know that you are never too young to be safe. It seems that all walks of life find it beneficial to have gained this awareness, even if they are not ready to make a change quite yet. We all have resistance to change, but we don't have to let it evolve to the point of crisis. Health Advocates also offers a free equipment exchange program where we accept and donate new or used walkers, wheelchairs, transfer benches, etc. We keep inventory of everything in stock, and all a person needs to do is call our offices to see what we have in store if they want to donate or make the proper arrangements. Again, thank you very much for allowing me to inform you about our services. Please do not hesitate to call the office if you'd like to know more about the Home Safety and Fall Prevention Program. Thank you. Thank you very much, Josh. And just because it just showed up in chat, is the Home Safety Assessment free or do people have to pay for that? It is free. Thank you. Okay, we aren't quite a Q&A yet. We have one more important presenter from the Friendly Visitors Program at Lenox Hill Neighborhood House, James Goldman. Thank you for patiently waiting, James. Thanks, Senator Kruger, for having myself and the organization and for all of us together. Um, I'm just going to share my screen. So I wanted to take an opportunity to share about the Friendly Visiting Program here at Lenox Hill Neighborhood House. And, um, and also just a, a little side part um, about case management, all these programs um, basically to help address um, loneliness, social isolation, a lot of the things that I know um, all the folks here have been talking about. Um, so what is the Friendly Visiting Program? The Friendly Visiting Program is designed to build friendships and limit social isolation. So the Friendly Visiting Program connects older adults uh, with friendly and committed individuals in the community to call or visit in the home. And basically interactions um, from the Friendly Visiting Program can include everything from talking about shared interests, experiences, and visits between volunteers um, and clients can include playing cards, knitting, going for a walk, really any kind of mutually agreed upon um, activities for socialization and connection. And we've really found that these contacts in turn have really formed, helped form friendships in the process for older adults, and especially for those who may be, um, you know, not have as many people to talk to. Um, so it's really been a tremendous um, program 
for so many of the older adults that we serve. And again, this program really can provide a sense of connection to the outside world, really something to look forward to and really a sense of contributing to society through um, older adults sharing your own wisdom, knowledge, talent, and stories, and um, really having that relationship um, progress. So who is eligible for um, the Friendly Visiting Program? So a couple of things um, that are listed here. So it is for um, any individuals who are 60 years of age or older. And basically um, individuals should have at least one functional ADL limitation or two IADL limitations as shown by need for assistance from another person. So this just really means that we're mostly working with, we're working with clients who, um, it's, it's a little bit harder to get out of the home um, and what we would call homebound. Um, and as I'll mention, there's also other programs for, for folks who, um, you know, maybe getting out of the home more. Um, but another um, requirement is um, that you need to live in, for our friendly visiting program, in the um, our Lenox Hill Neighborhood House catchment area, which is in Manhattan from anywhere from East 59th Street to East 143rd Street. And that also includes Roosevelt Island. And the last piece regarding the program is that um, if you're interested in the program, you just need to be open to being assigned um, to a case manager um, because part of the program is for someone to check in with you about how the program is going and also about other needs that you may have. So it kind of um, encompasses a lot of goals in that respect. So who are the volunteers? We have such an array of volunteers that come to the Friendly Visiting Program, individuals in the community from a real variety of different ages, backgrounds, industries, and experiences. Um, the volunteers that we have are really interesting people and, and, and love to socialize and, and um, you know, talk with older adults. Um, and, you know, volunteers who will be part of this program do have an initial interview regarding their interest, um, and they are required to complete reference checks and background checks that are reviewed just to ensure um, suitability and, and safety, of course, with working with any older adults that are a part of our program. So what is the next step if you're interested in the Friendly Visiting Program, and what will the process look like to be matched? Um, this is pretty, pretty broad brushstrokes, but just wanted to give a little bit of the sense of, of the steps. But of course, first, please contact us, call us on the Lenox Hill Neighborhood House Case Management Intake Line at 212-218-0506. Again, um, this information will be sent out um, after the talk as well. Um, and just in terms of a little bit of the steps and the um, timing, so again, the first step, if you're interested in the program, you would contact us um, and have an, an intake completed. Um, and that again can take, um, depending on you know, contacting and, and um, moving forward uh, a few, you know, pretty quickly or up to a few weeks or so. And then you'll be assigned, the second step was you'll be assigned a case manager, as I mentioned. So the case manager will, talk to you further about the Friendly Visiting Program. Also, again, just check in if you have other needs um, as well, if you might need assistance with other things. And then the third step would be meeting with our Friendly Visiting Program staff about your interests. We really wanna take this opportunity to understand what um, someone who's interested in this program um, what your interests are in, in a volunteer specifically who would be talking or meeting with you. So getting to know your hobbies, getting to know your interests, what kinds of things make you tick? What kinds of things do you enjoy? And so we can um, you know, take that into consideration with um, matching for a volunteer. And of course, also just understanding too, are you looking for contact over the phone or would you also prefer in, in contact, um, in person, um, at your home. 
Um, so either of those can be offered. So we would wanna explore that with you. And then the fourth step is just the matching process. So again, that can take up to um, a couple of weeks, month or so, a couple of months, depending on you know, what you've shared with us, the volunteers that are available and making sure that we can find someone that you know, would be a good match. So what if you're not eligible for the Friendly Visiting Program? I just wanna highlight um, the Friendly Voices Program, which is based on the Friendly Visiting Program model, is also for older adults who may be isolated for other reasons. And so again, you don't have to be um, homebound um, and it may just be that you're looking to again, be matched um, as a part of the, um, to speak with the friendly visitor or volunteer. So volunteers are matched again with older adults um, by phone or video and can also join groups. And so older adults can contact Aging Connect. Um, and then also the Institute on Aging Friendship Line is another resource that I just wanted to mention. That's just a warm line for anyone who may need further emotional support and wanting to reach out. And again, I know these resources will be provided as well um, at the end. And then finally, I just wanted to also mention about our um, case management program, which is very much connected with the Friendly Visiting Program. But I just wanted to highlight a couple of aspects of the programs, um, one of which is the Meals on Wheels program. The Meals on Wheels program, which provides a lot of nourishment um, and meals to older adults. Also, um, a meal deliverer comes by, a very friendly face to come um, and gets to know many of our clients personally. So that's also a way on a daily basis to reduce isolation. Um, if you are needing assistance with home care or by getting home care assistance, a lot of our older adults have really gained a lot of socialization aspects from that um, and having someone to not only meet their needs in the home, but you really develop a close relationship. And then again, by having a case manager and someone in the, your local area who can speak with and will also visit with you, um, can engage and further help you feel connected to the community. So we hope that everyone will reach out to us if you're interested in any of these programs. And again, want to thank Senator Kruger for, for having us. Thank you very much. Really appreciate your presentation as well. See, there's already so many resources in our own community that people might want to be reaching out to. And again, don't worry about writing down everything you've heard because everything that's going into the chat will be sent to you um, in the next day or two. And I think Betsy Timmerman referenced some senior resource type guides that her organization, Health Advocates, has available. I want to quickly reference that if you don't have a copy of the senior resource guide put out by my office, um, you should please reach out to us after today's event and ask us to send you a hard copy, although it's also on computer, but I actually think this one works better as a hard copy that you can look through. Um, so if you email my office at lkruger at nysenate.gov or you call us at 212-490-9535, we will send you out um, the senior resource guide that we've had interns and volunteers helping us fine tune over the years and update over the years. And it has really an unbelievable collection of resources that you might find valuable for yourselves. So now we've gotten to the Q&A portion of our webinar. Many of you have submitted questions in advance and I will try to get through those. We probably won't get through everyone because we're already running a little late. That always happens to us, especially when we have so many good presenters. And so if we don't get to your question this afternoon, please feel free to reach out to my office after today to try to do follow up on questions that you still have that we didn't get to. And just to remind you, we're going to email to you the list of all the resources listed in chat today. And we also will allow you to put questions into, I think, the Q&A function in Zoom and Facebook. And my staff will forward them to me if we have a chance to get to them after I start to go through 
the questions that we got in advance. And I think that all of our panelists should feel comfortable jumping in with an answer to any of these questions. I don't know that any of them are specific to any individual panelist. Um, so let's see, starting with, do you know of available services that reach out every morning to check to make sure someone is alive and well? Are any of these programs that you're involved with a daily reach out and check program? Just take yourself off mute if you think you have an answer. I'll, I'll just start. Uh, you know, the Friendly Visiting Program um, is a great resource, although it's more on a weekly basis. It may not be as much on a daily basis, although there can be some Friendly Visiting Programs. I know um, in other um, organizations or, or situations that I think can um, follow up a bit more. Um, I also would just add that um, the Meals on Wheels program, again, as I mentioned, is a nice program that because there would be a um, Meals on Wheels deliverer coming to a senior's home, you know, an older adult's home, it is a nice check-in and kind of a brief sort of just hello and it's a nice way on a daily basis to be checked in. So depending on what you're looking for, that um, might be something that could be helpful in that case. Thank you. Okay. How can senior citizens learn about volunteer opportunities for themselves? Anyone want to jump in there? I love that question. Uh, and I think a, a bunch of us will probably weigh in. So you've got all of these community-based organizations. I can't imagine any of them would turn down uh, an opportunity to get a volunteer. The Department for the Aging um, is our Office for Aging in New York City, is connected with many of these organizations. And then in New York State, there's the New York State uh, Commission. Um, and I think I'm gonna mess up the name, but I'll make sure I get the link that actually lists a variety of volunteer opportunities um, throughout the state by organizations that put those on there. Now, it does require them to actually be proactive and do that. Um, but depending on what your interest is, um, a phone call to that particular organization, I think you'll find very good results. Okay. All right. I know. Go I ahead, think Nancy. Yes, go right ahead, Nancy. I want to recommend Volunteer Referral Center, which is an amazing program that has provided so many wonderful volunteers to health advocates. And they do meet with individuals who want to volunteer one to one in their office and find out exactly what they're interested in. So it's a very personal experience. Thank you. I wanted to mention the Community Service Society's our SVP program, Retired Senior Volunteer Program, um, that is actually a pretty sophisticated system um, and I think places about 3,000 senior volunteers per year. Um, so I know our resource guide has a listing for volunteer options and I'm sure that the CSS RSVP program is there and maybe my staff can find their contact information to put into chat as we're speaking. So there are many different options and I certainly encourage people to explore those because, you know, as was I think raised by um, the Reverend in his 531 presentation, it's both reaching out to others and others reaching out to you. And so I often find that volunteering you can get just as much from for yourself as what you were actually providing to others um, and many churches and synagogues also have their own volunteer program so you could also check with um, your religious institution if you're involved with one or near one um, where do seniors go to meet people who are not necessarily the younger iphone or generation which is an interesting question because I actually think that, you know, intergenerational stuff can be fabulous um, as we're aging and, and not wanting to feel um, alone or lonely, but are there specific places where people go to meet others? I think senior centers is the obvious place. Um, 
Any and other? also health advocates. Okay, and health advocates, thank you. Uh, yeah, and libraries. I mean, there's a variety of community organizations, but I think as Reverend uh, Matt talked about and, and others, there are events that organizations put on daily uh, through the city and, and across the state that aren't always overwhelmingly attended. So, you know, keep your eyes out for those flyers and those messages about all the events, whether it be a senior center, a faith-based organization, or a community-based organization that has on a revolving basis all the time. And don't be afraid, you know, go and, and say hello and, and, and you'll meet people. And thank you, Greg, for highlighting something that wasn't set up till now. New York's public library system is phenomenal for offering different kinds of programs and activities and they're always free services and they are just run the gamut from programs for the youngest to the oldest. And so if you haven't gone and visited your neighborhood library in a while, you really should go find out what they're offering there because um, I think you will be quite surprised at the diversity of programs. So thank you for highlighting that. So why don't senior centers have hybrid classes? Some seniors aren't able to take classes in person. Which is, I'll just, well, before I open it up, I'll point out, I think that everybody's getting better at that. There are more hybrid options available. Um, there's even one or two senior centers that are online senior centers. And there's a program called OATS that helps people learn how to use their computers. Um, so that if for, for older New Yorkers learning how to use computers so they can access programs through a hybrid online model. Um, is there anything else people want to mention here? Well, you're going to be seeing a lot more of that. You're exactly right, Senator. So I, I track the uh, senior centers that are open and what their capacity has been uh, since the pandemic. And uh, about 80% of the centers around the state are open, but they're operating at about 50% capacity pre-pandemic. Um, I, I think everybody is now getting more comfortable if you have access to Wi-Fi, et cetera, the hybrid option. Oats is a perfect example. I think they operate in about 80 senior centers in the city. Uh, we have a partnership with uh, Self-Help and their virtual senior center uh, that we've expanded to 30 counties in upstate and the Get Set Up platform uh, does exactly, if not more, than what the OATS platform does. The first three things you're trained to use are Zoom, whatever um, you you have, an iOS or a smartphone or a tablet or a PC, so that you can engage. But I think the future is going to be much more hybrid. I mean, what I've seen on meetings like this is, you know, pre-pandemic, let's say, and not yours, Senator Kruger, because they're always well attended, but give an example of, you know, you'd have 50 people that would show up in person. And since, uh, you know, since you have an hybrid option, you're looking at three, four, 500 people. Um, so I think you're going to be seeing a lot more expansion of that, especially as, um, you know, the rest of the state um, has better access to high speed internet. Thank you. Um, so this is- May I say something too? Um, I hope that, oh, sorry. Um, Health Advocates has a lot of programs on Zoom. The one, uh, Lynn Cremando, who's going to be working with you tomorrow, has a 9.30 a.m. Zoom program on the Health Advocates website, and all people have to do is call so they can click in. Um, and, and Nancy sends out a weekly calendar, a monthly calendar and a weekly calendar, and it says which are, are on Zoom and which are in person. So that's a resource for anybody who would like to try it. Thank you. Thank you. And again, I'm going to reference not just senior centers, but many religious institutions because of COVID have now started to provide online classes and programs and actual religious services, if that's what you are, if that's your jam, as they say, online. Mm -hmm. I know my synagogue has a morning meditation program every morning that my sister is encouraging me to do. I personally am not into meditation despite my sister's <laughs> for me to be, but there are all kinds of programs that I have not found. One of these institutions that requires you be a member either of their faith or of their church or synagogue or mosque 
to participate in their online programs. So there's really a fairly diverse selection of programs. The library got raised already. I also want to highlight that um, our city university and many of our private colleges also offer like for very low cost per semester an opportunity to audit classes by seniors. Um, so if you're not actually looking to get a degree, you can audit classes, including many of these schools now have online classes. So it's also a way, probably more in person, that you would have a chance to meet people with similar likes and interests with, your, with you, um, because that was somebody else's question. How do you find buddies who share similar likes and plans? Um, but actually, if you participate in classes in person at your senior center, at a local college or the library, it's likely you will find people who share some interests with you because they look for the same kind of class or programming that you did. Um, so I'd say try a bunch of different ways and places. Um, okay. Can I add something? Yes. Um, for three years, I worked at an organization called City View Connections. It's a clubhouse in Long Island City, and it's one of 10 clubhouses in New York City, um, part of the Clubhouse International Coalition. Um, the only requirement for membership is a diagnosis of any mental health condition. So that ranges from depression to the ex more extreme schizophrenia. It's a community-based organization. It's, we meet in person and hybrid. And it's uh, it's a really beautiful um, organization, and you have to be 18 and above. And um, in my experience, there were a ton of seniors that benefited from it. So. Great, thank you. Wonderful. Yes, Betsy, did you want to say something? Oh no, I thought that was such a good thing. No, I there. I mean, I think there are so many different communities. I mean, you know, just even getting involved in a museum. You know they have free programs um, for for people, and if you have children, and you, you don't necessarily have to be a member of these museums. A lot of them have open, you know, one day a week. I'm not sure which day it is for which museum, but um, they also have drawing programs if you're taking care of children or, you know, that sort of thing. So wonderful lectures and the wonderful opportunities and. It's great to see the Department of Aging has so much to offer. Mm -hmm. Thank you. This might be a question for me, but anybody else is welcome to jump in. How are ways that older people can become politically active in their communities? Um, so I'll just start out from, there are things called Democratic clubs, Republican clubs. There might be third party clubs that, that also exist. I don't know. Um, and you can, actually easily go online and just look up what clubs are in your neighborhoods. And they very often nowadays are hybrid, where the meetings take place both on Zoom as well as in person. And I don't know of any political club of any party that is limiting the age category of people who participate. Um, I know I was asked to speak the other night at one of my political clubs in my neighborhood and it was on tax policy. And I thought, oh, no one's gonna show up. Really, tax policy is one of the drier, although I think very important topics. And it was like a full meeting on Zoom and in person. And it definitely drew in a wide age range of people. And of course, you don't necessarily have to be a member of a political club to go to their meetings either. I've never heard anybody turned away. So check out local political clubs. Actually, I. Some people might think this is amusing. I was asked to speak at a local Republican club a few years ago. I said, well, you know, I am a Democrat. They said, I know, but like we ran out of Republican elected, so nobody comes and talks to us. I was like, oh, sure, I'll come and talk to you, no problem. <laughs> they said, we're gonna ask you tough questions. We're the other side. I go, go for it, that's fine with me. Um, so check out political clubs, whatever your party interests are, but you are more likely to find Democrats in Manhattan. Um, all right, how do you find a good healthcare manager? Is there anybody on this call who feels that this is their territory? I can share a little bit. Um, 
I know I mentioned we have a, a case management program at Lenox Hill Neighborhood House. So um, you can contact us about, you know, um, having a care manager through our program. Um, a lot of seniors or older adults may find um, health care managers um, through their doctors, through in their insurance, um, through a lot of different other ways, um, and may not even know that there are healthcare um, managers available to them, um, but they haven't, um, that they're there kind of to, to utilize. Um, so I would say in a lot of, a lot more now, there's a lot more care managers, care coordinators, you know, lots of different um, professionals there to support um, older adults. So it just is also a matter of also asking, you know, asking again for your, you know, your insurance, your your local doctor, um, provider um, to get more information as well. And of course, our program. <laughs> and Senator, can I just build yeah. upon that? Because, you know, James raised a really great point. And I, I think that there needs to be a connection. So as you know, Senator, I started as a case manager in the aging field 30 years ago. Um, you know, under Medicaid, you have care coordinators, right? And they're supposed to coordinate health care. The value of what James is talking about is often very underlooked. And what, what, what case managers do in our network is very comprehensive. Most, most health care costs have nothing to do with your diagnosis. They have to do with your own behaviors. Do I smoke? Do I walk? Do I eat well? Or the built environment. And very few have to do with your actual diagnosis. So the value of, of our network, the James types of folks, what I did earlier on cannot be understated because they're gonna be looking at the built environment, looking at uh, falls, hoarding, do you, have, do you have food in the refrigerator, hopefully doing a so social isolation screen, a tech check, looking at benefits that you might be eligible for, uh, and things of that nature where in from the clinical side, they really don't do that. They're just managing appointments or you know follow up, did you go see XYZ? The best model are to integrate those two things, the, the case manager and a care coordinator. So you have real info in, in, in real time that really serve put people holistically so they don't fall through the cracks. Thank you. You know, we all need that, that combination. Yes, Alden, you have your hand oh, up. I, I, this is from the patient's point of view, but I, everybody should carry on their ID cards in their wallet a list of all the medications they take. I was with a friend who didn't have it and it was critical to her care. So that's just a little thing, but it, it would be a help to anybody who encounters this person. I can't agree with you more. Everyone should keep their list of medications on their phone or some way in their wallet so that even if they end up incapacitated, but an ambulance is taking them somewhere, they can find this for you. It's, it actually is quite crucial. And that sort of ties to the next question. Are there digital sources for registering final arrangement documents um, for people who might not have family living alone? So, you know, living will situation, others than that. I know that my office has hosted quite a few presentations on this for people. So I'm actually going to ask Wendy. Wendy, is there an online set of educational programs that can help people know what these documents are and what they need to have filled out. So getting myself off of mute is always Sorry, a challenge. So what I'm going to do is I think I'm going to send a link out with the event video, which uh, from our presentation, uh, earlier this year about uh, some end of life planning resources and if in on those pages those web pages you can watch the event and you can also find some resources great um, because those have been very well attended and it's incredibly important that you think about this try to get materials put into writing and signed off on and that you discuss with family members or friends and loved ones what your wishes are before something terrible happens, because that's not the time to start having the conversations. So nobody ever wants to think about end of life and nobody ever wants to think about 
writing these things down what their wishes are and aren't but I have to say I you know I lost both of my parents over the course of the last five years and we did make them sit down with us and really discuss with us what their wishes were and then they both suddenly got extremely ill and couldn't possibly have made these decisions correctly for themselves then and I was just so happy that I actually had listened to my own office's advice about making sure people were doing this and that I had that all done and that they had told me what their wishes were and that we had done the paperwork and got the signatures and it was just it was like real life hitting hypothetical and showing me why it's so crucial to have those discussions, even though no one really ever wants to sit down and have those discussions. Um, but it really is important. So thank you, Wendy. We've done some good programs on this and we can share those with everyone. And we have actually hit the time where I'm supposed to be now thanking you all um, for participating with us today. Um, it's amazing how rapidly the time flies by. I want to thank our presenters, Greg, Matt, Alden, Nancy, Betsy, Josh, and James, who were all so helpful today. And again, everybody on this will be able to get access um, in a day or two to the watching it again, getting all the materials. You can tell friends they'll be able to sign up to get it as well. Um, again, if you want a copy of my senior resource guide online, you can find the link in the chat. If you want a hard copy, and it's sort of more useful as a hard copy unless you're great at the computer, then you're going to email my office or call my office and ask for a copy to be sent to you. And I want to remind everybody that tomorrow, Wednesday, October 26th at 2 p.m., um, I'll be holding the second session of my virtual senior resource fair and tomorrow's um, presentations are all about exercise and meditation. See, and I already, already bad mouth meditation. They're going to fire me from this job, um, but that's what we're doing tomorrow. And on Thursday, October 27th, the third day and final session, um, we will be having presentations um, about older adults and how can they actively engage in the arts, um, both in person and through hybrid options. So again, thank you to all my panelists. Thank you to all my staff, without which I couldn't do any of these things. Um, have a really good day, and I'll see some of you again tomorrow afternoon. Same bat station, same bat channel, for those of you who remember that line from childhood. Thank you so much. Thank you.